Morning, everybody. Welcome on the session about access control. Um, we're almost half into this week of SecUp Dev. I hope it's going well for now. So to let, to let me briefly introduce myself first. My name is Martin de Katta. I'm a postdoctoral researcher of the uh, Disternet Research Group of KU Leuven. I just recently finished my PhD about access control for multi-tenant software as a service application. So if you have specific questions about that, I would ha be happy to discuss. Um, this presentation will be more about access control as a whole. Uh, since I spent the last four and a half years thinking about access control, I can probably talk about it longer than would interest you. And in this presentation, I have tried to focus on the more generally known concepts in access control, mostly the access control models out there, and then how to, um, how to properly introduce access control in your application code if you're a developer or a vendor yourself. I hope that that suits you guys as well. Um, so regarding the presentation, I put a complete presentation available on the SecUpDev website. But, uh, that was 120 slides or something. I will not go uh, across, them all of, across all of them here. Um, so know that there is more information available online. And secondly, I do not mind questions during the slides. So please interrupt. Just raise your hand if you have a question. So let's dive in. So first, access control. What is access control? Access control is a part of security, of course, that constrains the actions that are performed in a system based on access control rules. And these access control rules can be almost anything. For example, um, Bob can read a certain file, and he cannot read a certain file, uh, up to very application-specific and very elaborate access rules, like um, a bank clerk can only access the accounts of people who are associated with the office of this bank clerk, something like that. So more complex, more application specific. As with any security, access control focuses on confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Uh, now, most of the time, access control is positioned with a focus on confidentiality, so constraining who, which users can access, access which part of the data in an application. But in, in, in practice, it can also focus on integrity. For example, if you block a certain action that would, would uh, pull a server down or something like that, then that's availability. Integrity is then about updating data. So it's any of these three. Access control, in essence, is a layer between potentially malicious users and then the protected system. When we talk about the guard, I will go deeper in that later on. And access control definitely is part of the trusted computing base for your application. So it's part of the, of the stuff that you have to get right in your application in order to be sure that it's a secure application. So to start off, an example of access control in the real world, a door, or better said, a door with a lock. And this, this is a quite simple example of access control that you all know. And in this case, the mechanism is that you use a key to unlock the door, and with this door, you protect your house and the stuff, the assets in your house from people you don't want to enter. And while it's a quite, a quite uh, simple example of access control, you can already say some interesting stuff about this example. First of all, it's access control is not easy to get right because you, you can have this very heavy door with a five-point lock uh, and a very, very uh, secure key, unforgeable key, for example, but it's all worth nothing if there's a window open just next to it. So for access control, you have to think about all the entrances to your system and, e and secure them all. Secondly, this example also shows that there's a difference between an access rule and a mechanism that enforces these rules. Here, the mechanism is the lock and the key. An access rule can be almost anything, but most commonly it's that every one of your family can access your house. And then if someone is staying temporarily in your house, then you also give him a key, and in the end you take that key back to enforce this rule in this mechanism. And thirdly, different mechanisms have different properties. And most importantly, different mechanisms support different rules. In this case, the, the lock and the key is quite flexible because you can hand the keys over to almost everybody, to family, to colleagues, to, to, pay, to, to people who are staying temporarily, etc. But this, this flexibility is also limited because uh, you can imagine it's quite tedious to enforce a rule like uh, that someone can access your house within 8 o'clock in the morning and 8 o'clock in the evening. That's, that's, that's almost impossible to enforce with this, with this mechanism. To contrast this with a completely different access control mechanism, Think about a, a personal guard at the entrance of, for example, a parking space. 
This guard can use your license plate, your passport, your age, your, your face, whether you are alone, can, it can use the, the, the time of day to enforce a whole spectrum of access rules. For example, only grant access to people who are alone in their car, who are an employee of the company, and only within eight, um, between eight in the morning and eight in the evening. So clearly this, this mechanism is more flexible. It can express more access rules. And also, if you want to change these access rules, you, in theory, you, also, you only have to talk to this lady and she will enforce the new access rules. So it's all, also more versatile, more, uh, more easy to update the rules. But also, it's more expensive than just a front door. So why am I telling you all of this? It's, it's to raise the point that there are different mechanisms with different properties and probably there's one mechanism that is best suited for your specific problem. And it's a bit the same in software. Um, and there are different mechanisms and there are a lot of mechanisms, for example, uh, like these things. So the, these are all access control examples in, in practice in the real world. This talk is about access control in software. And while the techniques of enforcing access control are, of course, completely different, we reason about similar things, about mechanisms, about rules, about policies, about complete mediation, about which rules you can, uh, you can enforce, that kind of stuff. So what does access control in software look like? You all know it. For example, the login screen at Windows, this, this constrains access to uh, your machine as a whole, your operating system as a whole. Now, for example, access to a certain web page access to information within a certain web application, for example, in Facebook. Then uh, similarly for e-banking, access control is the, thing, is the part of this application that determines which accounts I can see and which transfers I can make. As another example, access control determines which files you can access and determines which services you can start. For example, in this case, access was denied because I uh, couldn't uh, lock the, the appropriate ports. So access control is in, every access con is in every application that manages data of any value, and it's, to me, it's one of the most core parts of security out there. But unfortunately, it's also quite hard in practice, and that's what this talk is about, of course. So here is an outline of the rest of this talk. I just um, introduced access control. I will next go a bit deeper into positioning access control, what it is and uh, what concepts there are from a very high level point of view. Then I will spend quite a lot of time on the different access control models and then afterwards on how to enforce access control in a practical application, in the code of an application. Then in the end, I wanted to very briefly touch the bigger picture, which is um, identity and access management. Um, and then afterwards, I also added some slides about the important technologies for access control in practice being uh, OpenID, SAML, federated authentication, uh, and OAuth for federated authorization and related technologies. I don't think I will have the time here, but I noticed that these are not discussed in, in, in another talk in this week. So I wanted to add some slides so we at least have a brief overview of these technologies. And finally, I will conclude with a short recap and conclusion. So first, positioning access control. From a very high level point of view, a 10 kilometer uh, high point of view access control is often depicted with this picture. So you have uh, a user that performs a certain action on the system in which you have these protected resources. And in between this user and this, this, uh, this resource, there is this guard that performs access control. And in terms of terminology, I now talk about users, but in general, it can also be a remote service, a machine. It can be a program acting in behalf of a certain user. So in general, we talk about subjects and, and principles as well in literature. In this presentation, I will mainly use the term subject. And then the re about resources, these are also often called objects, but uh, the two uh, terms are synonyms, so they mean the same. I will use the term resource. Now, this is a very simple representation of access control, but there is definitely more to it. Um, access control is these days often coined as, as the acronym AAA. And that's authentication, authorization, and audit. Authentication is the part of access control in which you try to verify that the subject is who he, she, or it actually claims to be. Um, and in practice, you can do that in the most simple case uh, using a password form. Or these days, you also see the signing with Twitter. But there are many, many options here. Authorization is then the part of access control in which you verify that a certain, that this authenticated subject is actually allowed 
to perform the requested action on the requested resource. And if not, uh, you do that by checking the access rules, by evaluating access rules. And if not, you block this action. And then audit is checking the actions that were performed by authenticated uh, subjects in your system afterwards. And for example, this is useful because not all access rules can be enforced uh, using the current state of the art in authorization. So with this technique, you can check the logs in your system, for example. And if there were actions that shouldn't have been performed, you can roll these back and punish these subjects for crossing the policy of your or company or your organization. So in essence, both authorization sorry, and audit folk build on authentication. And authorization is the part that blocks a certain action. Audit is the part where you punish your subject afterwards for having performed uh, and, and not, uh, not allowed action. And so access control is authentication, authorization, and audit. And for each of these parts of access control, there is a lot of research. Access control has been um, subject to research for more than 40 years now. And for example, for authentication, it all started with usernames and passwords. And you have biometrical uh, authentication. These days, you have multi-factor authentication, where, where you combine uh, passwords with your smartphone, with, a, with an SMS, with a PIN card, those kinds of things. You have federated authentication, like the sign in with Google button, that's federated authentication behind the screens where you federate or you externalize authorization to a party like Google, or Facebook, or Twitter, etc., etc., etc. For authorization, there is a lot of research about access control models, about how to integrate. Uh, access authorization better set in, in, in code and policy based access control is one of the techniques to do that. There are performance tactics to make sure that it doesn't hinder the correct usage of your application, again, etc, etc, etc. And for audit, there is stuff about secure audit, about user behavior analytics, analytics where you use uh, machine learning to process your audit logs, again, etc, etc, etc. So, um, that being said, the 10 kilometer high picture of before, in my opinion, should be refined to this five kilometer uh, high picture where you have authentication. So a subject authenticates to the guard. This guard in the first place performs authorization, but also writes out security logs, which you can afterwards check manually or uh, in an automated fashion. And if you see certain actions that shouldn't have been performed, then you uh, revert this action and punish the subject if needed. And why do I focus a bit here on, on the, the difference between authorization and audit? That's because actually these two techniques, while they are quite different, both of them can be used to prevent certain actions from being executed in your system. And for example, uh, at SecUpDev a couple of years ago, there was a, the case study of a certain hospital where their authorization rules are too hard to, to actually enforce in, in authorization, so by blocking an action. That's too hard to represent and write down. And what they actually did is to show, next to the, the, the data of a certain patient, a list of everybody who has accessed, of the last 10 people who have accessed this patient's data. So there they actually used audit and then social control to make sure and that, that physicians and nurses flag inappropriate use. That's, the, that's a bit the difference between authorization and audit. And if you do it well, then audit can also prevent certain actions from being executed in the first place. But of course, you don't... You can't block, for example, making a wire transfer of 10 million euros in a bank. So for that case, you will still need authorization. But it's an interesting combination, these two. That being said, if people talk about access control, they mostly mean authorization. And also for the rest of this presentation, I will limit to authorization and I will use the term access control as it is used in literature most of the time, being meaning actually authorization. So I will limit myself to this picture a subject making an action across a guard to a certain resource. But know that there is more to this than, than to access control than just this picture. And it's definitely not a problem that I limit myself to this picture because there's a lot to be said about access control, about authorization by itself. Um, so first, some more terminology. The things that I talked about where the, was the guard that authorizes specific actions. And then actually the guard, if we generalize it, is a mechanism that enforces a certain security policy. So the terms that are often used within access control are rules, policies, models, and mechanisms. And access rules are actually the, the logical access rules, independent of how you, how you write them down. So the, the, the business rules, the, the, 
the, uh, the ephemeral access rules if you want. And then a policy is a software artifact where you actually have written down multiple <coughs> of these rules in a certain format that can then be interpreted by code by your application. Then a model um, is a representation of how rules can be uh, expressed in a policy. And this model is very useful because it gives you a certain framework to first model your rules in, and then it also gives you a framework to, to reason about correctness of this enforcement, about full mediation, etc. But we'll spend quite some time on that later on. And then the mechanism is how you actually enforce these rules in this model uh, in your code. It's a low-level implementation of controls. So access control seems straightforward, but it definitely isn't. And the first reason why, ac while, uh, why access control is so challenging is that access control exists on multiple levels in a system. For example, on the lowest level, on the hardware, there you can have the CPU, which, and there the guard can be the CPU, which limits the access of a certain operating system process to the memory in your CPU or in your whole system. Uh, as another example, in the database, there the database management system will limit the queries that a certain user or a certain client of your database can perform on the database on the data in this database and on the top of the stack on, on, on the, the application stack in application code you can then limit which application specific uh, actions the users can perform in your application data in your application uh, itself and for example this is about reading patient files about making wire transfers etc while on lower levels we reason about network packages reason about database queries uh, etc. So why, why this, this makes it hard for you is that when you have these high-level access rules, the challenge for you is to translate these access rules into policies that can be enforced on each of these levels. For example, if you have an access rule about access to, to certain patient data, can this be translated into a firewall rule? I don't know. And then apart from this challenge, the next challenge is that all of these levels also work together. If you make a request to one application, then there will be access control on the network level, on the hardware level, on the database level, and on the application level. And you also have to make sure that they work together correctly. So that's one reason why, why access control is challenging. And the second reason is that access control also is challenging within each of these levels. For example, there you have to reason about expressiveness. Uh, each of these levels supports a certain access control model. There you have the question, can the high-level rules be expressed in terms of this access control model? <clears throat> then performance, as I said, uh, you want to enforce quite complex access rules, but the correct usage of your application should never be hindered by this process. So access control decisions are frequent and must be dealt with quickly. Then full mediation. If you add a guard to your system, how do you know that it sees every request or every action made in your system? And if you have a complete, uh, if you have full mediation for the guard, does your policy also cover every action? Didn't you forget anything? And then finally, safety. And that's about if people can, can, um, can update the policy themselves. Is there a sequence of actions in which your overall policy can be overridden, can be violated? And we'll get to that later on. So these are quite challenging uh, challenges. And uh, as an illustration of that, in the top 25 software errors of SANS, there's uh, access control in 11 of them. The red ones are for authorization and the blue ones are for authentication. And as you can see, missing authentication and missing authorization, which is actually the full mediation of before, are on top of this list. So definitely also a relevant problem in practice. So that's access control um, in general. I hope everything is clear for now. And I will now go deeper into some of the access control models. And the basic access control model out there was actually proposed in 1971. So that's 45 years ago. And this access control model is, the access, is called the access control matrix. And in that time, there was a lot of confusion about how to reason about access control in systems, in applications. And Butler Lamson was the first to propose this very simple uh, scheme where you just put the resources uh, as columns and the subjects as, as, uh, as rows. And in every cell, you just write down which actions this specific subject can perform on this specific resource. And we call that permissions. 
So that's a very, very easy representation of, of the permissions of the subjects on the resources in a system. Um, on top of that, there have been proposed more elaborate models afterwards. But this representation, to me, is still the basic representation that you want of the current authorization state of a certain system. This is what you want to know in practice. So on top of this, an, a number of more elaborate models have been proposed. And a number of these models focus on who can assign permissions in this access control matrix. And from a high level point of view, there are two main models here, two main approaches being mandatory access control or MAC and discretionary access control or DAC. And with mandatory access control, you have a central authority managing these permissions. With discretionary access control, you have the subject themselves managing these permissions. So man mandatory access control, as I said here, the permissions are assigned by a central authority according to a central policy. And this approach is a good fit for organization with a strong need for central controls, for example, in finance, in e-health, uh, originally mainly in the military or in government regulated secrecy systems. The large disadvantage of this approach is that it's, yeah, it's, it's not that flexible because for every time that you want to change a bit of the policy, then you have the central authority, you have to contact it. So this leads to a high management overhead. Um, that being said, it's a, often applied or mostly applied in, um, in government regulated security systems and military applications, often linked to multi-level security systems. I'll come back to that later on. And these days it's also uh, a main part of the main operating systems like with Windows mandatory in integrity control. It's also the approach of SE Linux and trusted BSD. Uh, and, and the goal there is to control the access of programs to the parts of your system of code. So that's mandatory access control. The opposite is discretionary access control. And the name here comes from that permissions are now set at the discretion of subjects themselves. And mostly this is because the subjects own certain resources and then you want these subjects to be able to manage their own resources. And the advantage of this approach is that it's highly flexible um, and permission yeah, in practice can, all, uh, can mostly be transferred. And the lack of a, but the disadvantage is that the lack of central control makes revocation and applying a central policy very difficult. Um, now, the advantages makes, make these, this approach quite, uh, quite attractive in practice. And it's often used, for example, in, in, in file systems with the Unix file handles, for example, that the owner of a file can, put, can, can manage the read-write flags of a certain file. And also in social networks, like in, in, in Facebook, I can manage my own data. So that's also a form of discretionary access control. But to show that discretionary access control is also quite challenging to get right, let's go a bit deeper into one of the more well-known models here. That's the Graham-Denning model, also proposed very uh, uh, quite long time ago in 72. So the 70s were a golden age for, for access control. And this model actually extends the access control matrix with a number of new concepts. So first of all, the subjects are now also represented as resources. So there are columns for the different subjects. Then resources have a certain uh, owner. So a file can be owned by Alice. Subjects can have a certain controller. And then permissions can also be made uh, transferable, with, annotated with a star, uh, with the asterisk. And then Graham, the graham denon model, using these concepts, it defines eight operations, eight commands, in which the, the, the access control matrix can be modified by these subjects themselves. So these commands are for creating and destroying subject and resources, for granting, transferring, and revoking permissions, and then for inspecting the authorization state. But that's boring. I will not go deeper into that. Um, so yeah, let's go deeper into the first seven of these rules. So first, Alice can now create an object or resource, and it's a different terminology, uh, of file one. And in that case, Alice will automatically be made the owner of this resource. Similarly, Alice can also create a new subject. And in that case, again, Alice will be the owner of uh, subject P1, process one. And every process is also made uh, in control of itself. That's the detail here, it's not, not that important. Then Alice can also destroy objects. And here the restriction is that Alice must own this, this resource. So in this case, Alice can, can destroy file one. And also Alice can destroy another subject. And again, you have to own this. And then for managing the access control or the permissions, 
Alice can grant permissions on every file that it owns. So if you own file one, like you can grant read or write permissions to another subject. Similarly, you can transfer a transferable right to another permission, uh, to another subject, and you can delete certain permissions if you own a, a certain resource or if you control a certain subject. So what I want to, to stress here is that this is, these are quite simple rules. This is a quite simple model. But already, this is not easy to get right in practice. And to show that, some questions for you. Here you have a cheat sheet of the, of the, the rules that I just mentioned. With this access control matrix, can Alice now read file one? Anyone? So in this case, it's, this was the warm up actually. <laughs> Alice cannot read file one because it's the owner, but it doesn't have a read permission. So in this case, with this access control matrix, that action would be denied. More interestingly, could Alice ever read file one? Is there a chain of events with these rules that Alice can give herself the read permission to file one? No? And, and yeah, she is the owner. So, so in this case, she could, using that rule, grant herself the read permission. Yeah. And then even more interestingly, could Bob, the second subject, ever read file one? Well, that's the catch, actually. Yeah. By himself, never. But by teaming up with Alice, it could. So in this case, there is a chain of events that crosses different subjects. But it would, if, if you don't want Bob to be able to access file one ever, you could not enforce this with this discretionary access control model. So this leads us to a large question here, and that's the question of safety. With these models, because you now distribute your access control management, you want to have some guarantees about reachable states. And so you have the question, given a specific starting state, like the matrix that we've seen before, and a given set of commands, like the commands of the graham denning model, can we prove any properties of all reachable states? For example, can we guarantee that Bob will never be able to read a certain password file? And that's a very hard problem in practice. It has been elaborately investigated in research. And for example, the, the, the results of Harrison, Ruzzo, and Ullmann, they presented a, a, a slimmed down version of the of the graham denning model, and they proved that it's an indecidable problem. So in general, you can't do it. You could further limit this model, but in that case, it wouldn't be workable anymore. So the conclusion is that while, mandatory ac while discretionary access control is very practical, you distribute your access control management, it's also hard to get right in practice. And in practice, you will always want a combination of both, where you provide some form of discretionary self-management, within the constraints of mandatory access rules. To me, that's the conclusion. And the options that you have there is, first, you could trust subjects to enforce a mandatory policy. It's not a good option. Secondly, you could audit the mandatory policy. So that's the combination between uh, authorization and audit that I talked about before. And finally, the most complex uh, form is that you enforce this mandatory policy. But in any case, you want a combination of both. So mandatory access control and discretionary access control both focus on who can assign permissions in, uh, in a system. Another set of access control models focus on how permissions are assigned. And the first a very basic model um, is identity-based access control. And with identity-based access control, you just assign a certain permission to a specific resource and a specific uh, subject. So again, this is actually just filling up the, the blanks in the access control matrix. Clearly, this is not a very scalable uh, management model. Because if you have a lot of subjects and a lot of resources, you will have a lot of management. So that's the first disadvantage of this very straightforward approach. And the second disadvantage is that information can also be leaked. Uh, for example, by a malicious user who can read it, and afterwards you have no control anymore what he can do with his data. Uh, and yeah, the same holds with if you have untrusted code that runs in name of a certain user. 
So um, new models were proposed that focus on both of these issues. I will now focus first on this issue. And to, to, to address this information leakage, the main approach is to control access of code. And the main model for this is multi-level access control. A multi-level access control, sometimes also called lattice-based access control, proposes uh, to, to have strict control over information flow. And in this case, you assign security cl classifications to resources and security clearances to subjects and their programs. And uh, both of them are called labels. And you organize these labels into a lattice, in, in, in Dutch, a roster, a eh, roundwerk. And for example, you can have top secret that trumps secret, that trumps confidential, that trumps unclassified. Or you could have more elaborate lattices where you combine multiple hierarchies into one lattice. And using these security labels, there are two main rule sets, if you want. That's Bell Lapadula and Biba, named after their authors, apart from being funny names. Um, it's a uh, I, I wondered about that. Is it? Are you sure? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Not wrong the first time I said it. It's okay, okay, thanks. Because I actually, actually had that discussion yesterday. I still don't know how you pronounce it. Lapadula. Lapadula, okay. Is he American? Yeah. Okay. Thanks for that. Yeah. So, <laughs> Bell La Padula, uh, there the rules are no read up and no write down, which is also called the star property. And this focuses on confidentiality. So, in a very simple example, you can have uh, two labels, two classifications, secret and unclassified. A general is given the clearance for secret documents, and a private is give it a, given the clearance for unclassified documents. And with these rules, a general will be able to read and write secret. Uh, documents. A private will be able to read and write unclassified documents. A general is also able to read unclassified documents, so that's the, the read down, which is allowed here. But the private will not be permitted to read secret documents. That's the no read up. And then the opposite of no read up, of the dual, is the no write down, meaning that the general is not able to write data to an unclassified document. And this rule is enforced because if you would allow this, then a general which you do not trust, who you do not trust, could read classified data and write it down into a document that could be read by a private. And this is actually the data leakage. So you want to, to, uh, to prevent this write down. And then the final arrow that is also permitted, and a bit strange to me, is that a private can also write data to a document of a general. Although he cannot read it, you can still uh, Fuck it up. <laughs> uh, so you can still uh, mingle this data, which the general would not like. So uh, the second model actually is the opposite. That's integrity. Here you have no write down and no read, uh, no write up, sorry, and no read down, meaning that both of them can again read and write documents in their own classification. Now the general can write data down. And the, the example that is often used is this is writing an order. So the general orders a private to do something. But a private cannot write the data of a general. A private cannot order around a general. And then again, what is uh, also permitted is that a private can now read this data of a general, and a general cannot read data of a private, which, which again is a bit strange. So neither Bell Lapadula or Biba are the models that you are looking for. And actually, in, in practice, you want both of them. But if you combine both of them, then you end up with, with with this picture. And that's also not what you want. So from this research, eventually, there became a more fine-grained technology, the more fine-grained technology of information flow and, and taint tracking. Now, I'm, I'm not the expert here, but here you think about the, the, the label of, of, of the confidentiality or the sensitivity of input and output. And then you prevent high input from ending up into low output. This should be output, of course. And low input from ending up into high output. But you also add declassification statements to code where you can check certain data and see, OK, this high input can be outputted. I verified that this can be outputted to low output. So this is more fine-grained. And this is a whole set of research following from Biba and La Padula. So that's multi-level access control. And so as I, um, as I mentioned before, the problems with identity-based access control are first the information leakage, which is the main focus on multi of multi-level access control. 
The second problem is the large management overhead. And in some sense, multi-level access control already addresses this problem somewhat because now you can manage your subjects and your resources in terms of these security labels, which is definitely better than individually assigning permissions. <coughs> but in practice, it's not the, the concept or, or, or the way that applications want to reason about access control. It's very specific to a military context. And so in the early 90s, role-based access control came up. And role-based access control, as the name says, it introduces the concept of roles. And a role bundles multiple permissions. So for example, here you can say, in general, a physician can uh, read and write every patient document. And a nurse can only read and write these two documents. And then you assign these roles to all physicians and, uh, and the nurse role to all nurses. And as you can see, this lowers the management overhead quite substantially. And more interestingly is that these roles also map quite neatly onto the, the jobs or the functions in a company, in an organization, which is a good thing um, and which, is, which explains the, the popularity of this model. So it originated in research in 1992 and it was eventually standardized in 2004 by the US National Institute of Standards and Technology. And there's really an immense research field here. It's a very simple concept, but there's research about structuring these roles into hierarchies in order to further limit um, um, the management over it. For example, you can state you have medical personnel and uh, a physician is an example of medical personnel, a surgeon is an example of, of a physician, etc. Then there's research about role mining, about how you come up with the best roles, the most optimal roles for your organization. Then there's research about administrative models, how you structure, how you limit who can assign permissions to a role, who can assign roles to subject, etc., etc. So um, an immense research field and a very interesting technology. But there's one big problem with this technology. Ah, okay, first, RBIC is also used in the wild. For example, many database systems support role-based access control with the with an admin role, uh, an operator role, a super user role, etc., And also um, many application development frameworks supported, for example, in Java Spring Security, you can annotate your methods with the, the pre-authorized annotation and check whether the subject, the logged in subject has a certain role or a certain permission because of these roles. So it's used in practice. So as I said, quite an interesting technology, but one big problem, and that is the problem of role explosion. And that's the problem that you, you see when you apply role-based access control to a realistic and large organization, then you often end up with an immense number of roles. And there are multiple reasons for this. First of all, roles cannot express ownership. So if you want to express that I can manage my own resources or a member of a certain team can manage the resources of this team, then you need a role like owns document A, owns document B, and owns document C, etc. A lot of roles that span from this in order to express this simple rule. And secondly, reality is also more fine-grained than these roles. So I said it maps quite neatly on the, the functions in a certain organization, but in reality you see that there are often small differences between persons in the same job, leading to yet another role. For example, a secretary who can print with, in color and a secretary who cannot print in color. And then the main reason for role explosion is that you actually have, uh, you require the cross product of all of these hierarchies. And then you end up, for example, with a role like sales manager for Belgium, which is location, with color print, which is this thing, owns document A, which is the ownership, which is clearly not what you want. And I also remember another uh, anecdote from, from SecUpDev a couple of years ago by Gunnar Peterson. That I don't know whether you know the name, but he's a security consultant, I believe. And he was telling the story that he, he visited a company in his job, and they were introducing role-based access control into their company. And he asked, how is it going? And he said, great, within next month, we want to have defined our thousandth role which is clearly not what you want from role-based access control, but it is what you see in practice, that your roles explode, the number of roles explodes quite, quite quickly. And so there are multiple ways in which you can, can address this, this problem. In practice, for example, what you see is a pragmatic choice between role-based access control, for combining role-based access control and ownership. For example, in Drupal, you can assign the permission to edit your own comments to a certain role, which is kind of a hack from my point of view, but it works quite well, I think. And in research, 
uh, there were a lot of extensions proposed for roles. For example, roles, roles that can be parameterized with a location, that can be limited in time, that can express uh, the ownership for a certain, or take into account ownership for a certain resource, etc. And eventually, out of these, I think, 10 or 15 uh, proposed extensions, eventually these extensions were generalized into the recent model of attribute-based access control. So of the models that I've discussed so far, attribute-based access control is the most advanced and also the most expressive one. In this case, your access rules are expressed in terms of key value properties of the subject, the resource, the action, and the environment. And for example, uh, examples of these attributes for the subject are his identity, his location, his department. For the resource, most commonly the type of resource, the date in which it was created, the confidentiality label for multi-level access control. For the action, you can reason about the type of the action, whether it's read, write, update, whatever. Uh, and for example, amount can be a useful attribute for action in, in wire transfer, for example. And then for the, for the environment, you see the type of the device on which a certain application is run, the timestamps or the current time, the system state, is it in overload, is it, uh, is, is it being hacked or something like that. And with these properties, with these primitives, you can express a wide range of access rules. For example, something very, com very complex is that managers of the auditing department in Brussels can inspect the financial reports from the current financial year within office hours. Okay, this is deliberately a very complex rule, but you can actually express this using the attributes of the subject, the action, the resource, and the environment. Uh, and to illustrate this, this would end up in the policy Permit if manager in subject.roles and subject.department equals auditing and subject.location equals Brussels, etc., etc. So quite an expressive model. And this is a very interesting property of attribute-based access control, but in essence, ABAC is more than just a model to express access rules. It's actually a new approach to identity and access management. Um, uh, this is the summary of what I just said. So for example, if you look at this picture, which I, I found in the, a NIST document about, about attribute-based access control, this picture depicts the different components in your organization that you have to have in order to apply attribute-based access control. So the essence is, first you have to define which attributes you have in your subject. So the users at our company have different departments, have teams, have, have ownership, have an age or something like that. And you also need to define the attributes that are available in the applications that you run in your company. To do that, you have to link this attribute repository to the actual applications, to the original resources, and therefore you need an object or a resource attribute binding and validation service. Then you have to uh, set up the database containing the subject attributes, which probably is a copy or a partial copy of some authoritative data managed by another department in another part of your, uh, in, in, of your company. Then you have to write policies in terms of these attributes. Uh, you have to store these policies, make them available to the policy decision point, et cetera, et cetera. So it's quite a lot. It's a super interesting approach to access control, but, but do, um, do, do see that this introduces quite a lot in terms of your trusted computing base. So it pulls in attributes of the HR department, uh, attribute database of the HR department most of the time. It pulls in policy evaluation uh, code. It pulls in a lot. And also it enlarges your trust chain as well. So not only the code that you have to trust, but also the people that you have to trust. So the conclusion for me for attribute-based access control is that it brings many interesting improvements compared to previous models. And it is seen by many as a next step in access control. And I know of a lot of companies who are merging gradually to this model. And it's definitely something that you should consider, but be aware that it's not a small step to take. And if you want more information here, I can uh, warmly recommend this document. It's in the, in the slides, this reference. It's by NIST, it's quite recent, and it gives an overview of ABAC, the challenges, and the considerations. Quite a good document if you're interested in this technology. So, um, these are the more well-known uh, models in access control. And I also wanted to briefly highlight some of the more advanced topics that we see. For example, one of the things that go beyond what I have 
presented here is the policy pattern of breaking the glass. And breaking the glass means that your users should be able to break the glass, like in an alarm, and override a deny of a certain, uh, a deny of a certain access rule of a certain policy. And this is a common pattern in e-health. For example, there a physician should be able to override a deny when a patient is in critical condition. So it's a quite common pattern, but it goes beyond what I have, what I have, um, um, what I have sketched for now. Because now you need to have an action that overrides a certain decision, and more importantly, you probably want a controlled override, being, meaning that probably you want to limit who can override a certain deny, for example, only physicians of the emergency department and not just a general practitioner. And you also want to limit for which actions a deny can be overridden, for example, only for reads and not that you can, can mess up the, the patient record of a certain patient because he is in a critical condition. And then, again, you want probably to audit these overrides later on, which again for, to, uh, goes back to the audit versus authorization, which I talked about before. For example, by writing out locks at override, and you see that again, the system becomes a bit more complex than before. But if you're interested, I would ha be happy to, to give you more details about how to do this best in practice. Another advanced policy pattern that we see is separation of duty. And separation of duty um, means that you want to separate the duties within your organization. For example, this means that you can state that a manager cannot approve or can never approve his own funding requests. And this is very relevant because of the recent, uh, 10 years ago, the Sarbanes-Oxley Act in the US that, that raises the bar for internal audit and internal structures of large enterprises. So for those kinds of, of legislation, you, you definitely need to enforce these kinds of rules statically or if you're in for a challenge, you could also do it dynamically. If you want to do it dynamically, then you can even enforce an access rule like if a user has had access to documents of bank A, he cannot access documents of bank B anymore. So that's another, um, another application of separation of duty, but that takes into account the history within your system. And this is actually originally described in 1989 as a Chinese wall policy. Maybe you've heard of, of that term. So this policy pattern is quite relevant, in, in definitely in, in domains like finance, in domains like e-health again, but it's also still a hard problem. It's, it's not solved, in my opinion, because it's still very hard to apply to an organization, meaning that it's not easy to say who can access what, even if you can enforce it. Um, and then it's also hard to implement as well, mainly because of performance issues if you want to do it dynamically. And so this, this advanced policy pattern brings us to another advanced topic, and that's history-based policies. So the dynamic separation of duty, or the Chinese wall policies, are an example of these history-based policies. Other examples are that a user cannot watch more than 10 movies per month. Um, in this case, you have, in general, multiple implementation options. You could use log files in the policy evaluation, so you go across the logs that, that store the history of a certain subject. You could use provenance data. That's a quite interesting, um, quite interesting approach, quite recently proposed by, um, not sure how to pronounce this. Do you know? Win. <laughs> when? OK. Just win. When? Like, you're not losing, you're winning. Oh, win. OK, yeah. cool. Wouldn't have guessed that. <laughs> and then finally, you could also use um, explicitly, you could also explicitly uh, update history attributes, which we have done ourselves. And that brings us to a final uh, advanced topic, which are obligations. So this is, this is a very brief overview of what is happening all over the place in access control. And this extends a basic access control decision with actions that can be performed with enforcing this decision. So for example, here you can state that you want to send an email to an administrator on deny to a confidential document. You want to write out a log, or you can up update a certain attribute, which then enables history-based policies. All of these things that I mentioned in the last 10 minutes are, to me, advanced topics. So they're relevant in some niches in access control, but they are still actively being researched and still quite a challenge to apply in practice. Um, but if you want, I can give you more pointers if you're interested or whether the, if these apply to your niche, to your uh, company. So that's a quite elaborate overview of the access control models and everything that's happening there. In the second part of this presentation, I wanted to focus on 
how you can actually enforce access control if you're a developer of, a, of an application or if you're a vendor of an application. So first of all, I've been talking for 52 minutes now. This is mostly the time when I want to stretch my own legs. So if you're the same like me, if you want to stand up or, or take some drinks or whatever, go ahead, now's the time. I will wait. Right, so for the second large part of this presentation, um, how you implement access control in an application uh, that you develop yourself, in application code. So to come back to the original picture, if you have this picture, then how you implement, how you enforce access control comes down to two questions. How and where to implement the guard, and secondly, how to encode the access rules in this guard. So for implementing the guard or adding the guard to a system, a very common concept is the reference monitor. A reference monitor in generally observes software execution and it then takes remedial action on operations that violate a certain policy. So a reference monitor can have multiple forms in practice. For example, um, if you see the distinction between an application and a kernel, then you can add a <coughs> reference monitor in between and observe the system calls. You could also add a reference monitor to some kind of interpreter around a certain application. This would, this would be part of a Java virtual machine, for example. Or you could uh, inline a reference monitor into the code of a certain application, which is explained quite neatly in this PhD. Uh, but in all cases, a reference monitor has three important security properties. And that's, first of all, full mediation, tamper-proof. It should be tamper-proof and it should be verifiable. So full mediation means that this reference monitor should observe all of the actions in its, in its interface, in its layer. So in the traditional way, this reference monitor, you should be able to prove that it sees all of the calls to, uh, to the kernel, all of the system calls. Tamper proof means that this reference monitor should not be, well, it should not be possible for an attacker to tamper with the code in this reference monitor because this would completely destroy the security of your system. And then verifiable means that because this is such an essential part of your uh, trusted computing base, that you should make it as small as possible so that you can verify it either manually or using automated methods, but you can say something about the quality of your implementation. Now, um, reference monitors, they again apply to all of the levels in which access control is, is, um, is, is enforced. So in terms of, of the hardware, then the reference monitor will be part of the CPU. In terms of the database, it will be part of the database management system. But the focus of the rest of this presentation is on making access control in your application code. And in your application code, the rules will reason about the concepts in your application. They will not reason about uh, network packages, they will not reason about database queries, but about, as I said before, in, in the, the banking application, about who can make a wire transfer from which account, uh, etc. So um, in this case, you have to add the guard or the reference monitor to the code of your application, which is a totally different approach in, than adding a, f uh, a reference monitor to the operating system and monitoring the execution of code. But again, the same holds. Again, you need full mediation, you need this, this guard to be tamper-proof, and you need to be, uh, this guard to be verifiable. You want this code, this access control code, to be localized and as small as possible to make it as trustworthy as possible. So in my opinion, there are two, uh, three possible approaches to adding a guard uh, and rules to application code. And the first approach is that you could just encode your access rules in the code of your application. For example, in this Java-like example, you could, um, in, in the method for fetching a certain document, you could just first fetch the document and then check whether the user is a manager and the user should be the, the owner of this document and the time should be between 8 and 5 p.m. So this is the, the office hours, for example. If this doesn't hold, then you return null. If it does hold, then you return the document because access is granted. This is a very straightforward approach. And so the, the, the benefits are it's straightforward. And secondly, you can encode, encode almost anything. Um, there are no restrictions apart from what you can encode in this programming language. But the big disadvantages of this approach is, first of all, you do not, you do not have separation of concerns. This means that, in this case, the developer of this application code is also burdened with 
security, with access control. While in practice you would want this access control to be defined by a security expert, a security manager, maybe even. And that's not possible here. And secondly, there's no modularity, meaning that in every um, method, in every yeah, Java method I mean, you will have this, this, this access control code, code and all, overall your complete policy will be spread across your complete application, making it very hard to review this access control code for correctness. If, for example, in eHealth you see a lot of uh, requests for, for, um, for certification. This makes this very hard. And then thirdly, if the rules change, you now have to update your application code, be, meaning that you will have to release a new version of your application, which you do not want, probably. And secondly, because you do not have modularity, you will have updates all over the place in your application code, and you will eventually lose sight of an overview of your policy that is enforced. So this is clearly not the way that you want to do this. A better option, option two, is that you shift from encoding the access rules in application code to modularizing them a bit. So for example, if, if I take the approach of Spring Security, you could, um, you could centralize all of the access control logic into one method, the authorization method in this case, where you ask whether a certain subject can do a certain action on a certain resource, and then here you encode them again in, in the programming language, but it's in one place. And this method is then called from your application code, and you can integrate this, for example, using annotations in Spring. You could use uh, different approaches in different frameworks. In this case, again, it's not rocket science, again, but it has some ad additional advantages. In this case, there is more modularity because your access control logic will be in one place. And also, if you want to update this code, this will be in one place. You will, yeah, this is better for the overview. But again, there is no separation of concerns, still no separation of concerns, and you still have to update application code. That's a bit of the disadvantages. Now, what makes this interesting is that most of the, the practical application frameworks out there, they support this approach. For example, if you look at Django, there you can have uh, a, an authentication backend that you can simply include in a configuration file, and this can have a method has permission to do exactly what I talked about. The same holds for Ruby on Rails, there they work with inheritance, where you can assign permissions to a certain user for a certain resource or model uh, that's part of your model of the model view controller. And you can also use this in, in the view even to hide certain parts of your application. And the same holds for Java Spring Security, uh, which I illustrated before very similarly. So this is a good approach, um, but still we have the disadvantages of before. The, the fact that you have to change your application code to change your access ru control rules, and that, um, yeah, that's the main disadvantage. So in research, there is a lot of attention spent on the third option, and, and a growing option, being policy-based access control. And in this case, you make the step from just modularizing this authorization logic to um, putting this authorization logic in a component called the policy decision point. And now this method, this annotation here, will call this policy decision point, which has been stored the policy. This will, it will evaluate this policy and return permit or deny. And the key here is that this policy is now defined in a format independent of application code, in a separate policy language. And if you then also store this policy in a database or in a file, you could just update this database entry or this file at runtime so that you can update your access rules without having to change your application code or even have to re re recompile or restart your application, which makes this a very interesting technology to me. So the eventual goal of policy-based access control is to decouple access control rules from application code. And therefore you want to express these rules in a format independent of your programming language and in application code, you then just ask the generic question, can this subject perform this action on this resource? And then behind the scenes, the policy is then evaluated by a specialized component that we call the policy decision point. And so as I mentioned, if you extend this a bit, then you can have a runtime variability, which is interesting. So the advantages here are even more modularity. Now you could even centralize access control logic for multiple applications, not just within the code of a single application. This actually achieves separation of concerns because now the policies can be written 
by a non-developer, by a security expert, independent of the application code. And if the rules change, you do not have to update your application code, and the updates, again, are in a single place. So this is nice. And if you, if you prolong this reasoning, then this actually enables you to, uh, for your access control policies to easily evolve with your organization. This is the problem that we see a lot in practice, that when, especially for large companies, when you take over a smaller company, when the teams change, when people change within the organization, then your access rules, your access control data should change. This brings this variability to the next level because you can also change the access rules that hold for your organization and for the applications. And in the end, policy-based access control actually works towards a vision in which you could centralize the policies for multiple applications used in your company. And because the policies, the access rules are now a software artifact, you, do, you could do very cool stuff like, for example, you could define high-level business rules that are then automatically refined into application-specific policies using the structure and the model of a specific application. This is the vision that policy-based access control works towards in order to, to further lower management overhead, simplify access control management, etc. But we are far from this vision, but it's a cool vision to work towards, I believe. So an important question um, if you want to use policy-based access control is how, you, uh, how do you express your access control rules in a policy. And therefore you need a policy language. And in literature there have been uh, a number of domain specific policy languages proposed. For example in 2001 you have the, this SPL policy language and Ponder by the Imperial College I believe was quite, uh, quite influential. Then these days you have Xacomel and then afterwards also very influential work is Cassandra and Secpal that work uh, about um, modeling more formally, the trust relations between multiple parties in a system. But these days, the, the major standard now is ISACAMO, or the Extensible Access Control Markup Language. This is a standard standardized by OASIS. The first version was ratified in 2003, and the third version, the, the last version, was ratified in 2013, so quite recently. And this language is attribute-based, so it expresses rules in uh, policies in terms of the attributes of subject resource, action, and environment. It's tree structured and it supports these obligations that I talked about before. Now we'll go deeper into this in the next slide. And then the format of XAML is XML, which I will also illustrate next. So the interesting thing of XAML is this model of these policy trees. So if you want to write down a policy, then you have to combine multiple logical access rules into one well-defined policy. And if you if one rule can deny a certain request and another rule can permit it, then you eventually will end up with conflicts between different rules. And so in your policy language, you have to reason about these conflicts. And Xacomel um, addresses this problem using the policy trees where you structure the multiple rules into a tree. The rules are the leaves and intermediate, yeah, they also call it policy to, to confuse stuff a bit. Um, and the rule has a, an effect and a certain condition for this to hold. And then a policy has a target stating my children hold for these requests. For example, all, all of this subtree will hold for the view actions. And then more importantly, these policies combine the results of their children using a combination algorithm. Like, for example, deny overrides that states if one policy of one child gives me a deny and another one gives me a permit, my result will be deny. Another one is first applicable that says the, the first deny or permit will be my final <coughs> result. And so this gives you the opportunity to merge multiple possibly conflicting access, rule in, access rules into one well-defined policy, which in practice is quite powerful. So the model is quite powerful and I'm really convinced of, 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 of this approach. And so as I said, Xacomel expresses this, this model, so, so expresses access control policies in this model using XML, XML. So here you see, for example, a role-based policy that simply says deny if the subject is a physician. Or you could um, express a treating relationship where you say permit if the owner of the resource is in the subject.treating attribute. You could also do time and you could also do dynamic separation of duty. So this clearly illustrates the flexibility of this approach. 
but I hope it also illustrates that nobody here wants, or at least not me, wants to write these kinds of policies. And so in the latest industry events and, 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 and academic conference that, that I attended, the opinion is growing that XAML is, is dead. If, if you're looking at using this technology, XAML would have been your main choice five years ago, but especially because of this format and also the rise of new lightweight, more lightweight technologies like OAuth, this technology is being uh, forgotten a bit these days. But on the other hand, I do believe in this model. And for example, we, we developed a, a prototype of a simpler policy language ourselves. And here you see the representation of the rules in the previous slide. So clearly very readable and much more easy to reason about. So the end of XAML for me does not mean the end of policy-based access control at all, nor the end of this uh, model of policy trees with attributes. That's the main message here. And so um, policy-based access control is, is being applied more and more, both in research and in, in, in practice. In research, we did quite some, well, at least I think, some cool stuff with it <coughs> ourselves. For example, we developed in my PhD the, the Amusa system, which is an, a system for multi-tenant SaaS applications. And the specific requirement there is that multiple organizations use the same application, the same code. Uh, and so these organizations all want to define their own access control rules on this shared application. So in that case, you have to have your policies outside of your application code. So we developed a system where you can manage your users in terms of attributes and then write policies that are immediately applied to the running application, which is quite a cool result, uh, I believe. And also, in practice, uh, very, uh, um, one of the main examples right now is Amazon EC2, or Amazon AWS, I should say. These also allow you, or allow their customers to, to write down policies in their own policy format, which is some kind of um, JSON representation of XAML, I think. So you can um, write down permit rules for a certain action, a certain resource, and a certain condition. Uh, and again, here the reasoning is <coughs> Amazon is a cloud platform, it's multi-tenant, so the customers all want to enforce their own access rules on this shared system. And again, you then want to have policy-based access control. So this technology is slowly getting there. But this example also illustrates that it's still quite hard. As for example, um, one of the supporting tools that Amazon provides you with, that's the detail, one of the supporting tools that they provide you with is um, a policy tester. So in, in this policy simulator, you, um, you state in terms of attributes that a certain subject makes a certain request, and then you get answers to which permissions this subject will have with your current policy. So this is a super useful tool. This is actually what you want. You write down a policy, you're not sure whether it's complete or whether, um, <coughs> whether it's correct, and here you get in a table uh, an exhaustive list of everything that a certain subject will be able to do. But, as you can see here, there are 193 actions here. So even with this tool, I think you will make mistakes. And even if you don't make mistakes in this tool, this is not a complete answer. This gives you the, the answer to which actions a certain subject can do, but not on which resources, on which types of resources, from which location, in which time of the day, etc. So it's an incomplete answer. And this, to me, proves that you have all of these advantages of policy-based access control, and we're really working towards this. But these advantages are still in the ideal case. It's still very hard to apply this in practice for a number of reasons. First, it's a different way of coding. The separation of concerns, research is not, is, is, it has not concluded whether you actually want this, whether this improves the security of these systems, though it sounds logical, it's not certain yet. Then policy languages themselves are not self-explanatory. You have the difference between our staple language and XAML language is, is, is immense in terms of readability, but still you have these policy combination algorithms, and writing a policy in this model is not straightforward. And thirdly, pol managing policies in an organization also requires processes for managing these policies with, with team reviews, with correctness checks, with, with um, business rules being drilled down to application-specific rules, etc. Also not trivial in practice. And then it requires supporting tools 
like policy editors and correctness checks, correctness tests, like the one I showed for Amazon. But these tend to be very application specific and you know, we're not there yet to do this on a wide scale. And then if you want to centralize authorization for multiple applications, you also need interoperability. This was a bit the premise of XAML, that's why they used the extensible uh, markup language XML, but it didn't work out in practice. And then finally, a very important point is that uh, your trust in computing base and your trust chain grow significantly if you also use this. It's, it's similar to the picture for attribute-based access control. And um, from my experience, I believe that many of these very concrete um, challenges are the result of the fact that authorization is inherently hard to separate from an application. That's the goal of policy-based access control, but if you, uh, if you pull the access rules out of a certain application, these rules should still be able to reason about the things in this application. If you have a banking application, then you, you want these policies to reason about wire transfers. If you have an e-health application, you want these policies to reason about patients and physicians. So, Policy-based access control wants to decouple these two, while there, there always should be a link. And currently, I believe the decoupling has been done, but it's too loosely coupled. Or as I heard a colleague said, it's lousily coupled these days. And this gives us these disadvantages, and so research is still continuing on finding the sweet spot. Still, still looking at how you can bind these policies a bit more to application code to guarantee correctness to guarantee completeness of your policies, those kinds of guarantees, but still maintaining the segregation, separation of duty. And it's a very hard problem in practice. So my recommendation for policy-based access control is it's, it's, there's a lot of expected of this technology, both in practice and in research. There are some applications in practice already where you can justify this technology, and it enables a lot of exciting stuff, but in my opinion, it's currently still too hard to apply in practice in general. So my recommendation for now, uh, if you think back about what we discussed about the last half an hour, the first step that you should do is modularize the authorization in your application code, so option two. And this provides benefits by itself, and moreover, if policy-based access control ever comes to be a real a reality, then your future proof because the interface of this modularization should be the same as the interface of externalized authorization. That's the premise. So go for this option. So that's the end of how to enforce access control. Now I have a couple of slides of the bigger picture. So what I talked about for now was mainly from my point of view of a software engineer. That's the stuff that I know most, uh, that I know most about. But the bigger picture, or the, the point of view of an enterprise, of a company that uses these technologies, or that uses applications that use these technologies, is identity and access management. And for example, if you look at the picture uh, provided by Gartner, identity and access management is a lot more than the stuff that we talked about right now. I mainly talked about access control, so you have authentication and authorization. But there's also a lot here about administration and intelligence. For example, for administration, you want identity governance and administration. That's a very long term for a technology that a company wants to be able to get an overview of their employees, for example, and what they can do in the different applications that they use. That's a completely different technology than the things that I talked about here. But customers of enterprise software do want this. And it's, it's, a, it's a large interoperability challenge as well. So we're completely not there yet. Similarly, for this intelligence, you have this user and, uh, and entity behavioral analytics. This is the audit part that I talked about, but then added on top of that machine learning. Where you can automatically see uh, this user used to do this in a week for the last two years, and now it does something completely different. Is this suspicious? Should I blog this? Should I report this? These kinds of automated machine learning technologies. Also very interesting, and demand is growing, but we're completely not there yet. And then if you look here, here you have externalized authorization management. This is actually the thing that I talked about for the last half an hour. This is policy-based access control management, which also enables you, to an enterprise, to centralize authorization management for the multiple applications it uses, and Gartner calls this externalized authorization management. And then there is a lot more here about authentication. So quite a lot of requirements here. And if you look at a different picture provided by Gartner, here you see that, that um, 
the technologies that I talked about here are all very complex, very state of the art, but also very strategic that most companies they know about uh, are still involved with, with password management, with user authentication, etc. So slowly but steadily, we're, go we're going to go up this arrow. Uh, and so the message here is what I talked about. It's, it's only part of the puzzle, but it is relevant if demand for these kinds of technologies grows from the customer point of view. So um, that's actually the most important stuff I wanted to talk about. So as I said, I added some slides about the most important technologies for some important technologies for access control in practice. Now I only have uh, like five more minutes, so I will go I will go across them very very briefly, just so you know the names. I think most of them are already uh, known by you. So the first thing is federated authentication. Federated authentication is a technology that is behind the sign-in with Google button, for example, or sign-in with Facebook. And in this case, you have a certain application <coughs> and an identity provider, Google or Facebook. And if, you want to, uh, if this application wants to authenticate this user, it will redirect, using web technology most of the time, the user to Google, let's say. This authenticates the user locally and sends a statement back, hey, I'm Google. Uh, and I swear to you that I authenticated this user as being Martin the Cat. That's simply this technology. A very common technology in practice because it provides a lot of practical benefits. For example, uh, it mainly originated because it now externalizes authentication from a remote application. That's an error, sorry about that. Um, and the advantage is that this lowers password reuse. Not every application requires a separate password, so you can centralize into one very protected password and authentication at Google with multi-factor authentication. And so this lowers password reuse and password breaking, which is a good thing on the web. And then the standards to achieve this in practice are OpenID and SAML, with SAML being the more enterprise-ready heavyweight XML standard and OpenID being the now deprecated low-weight standard. <coughs> And apart from federated authentication, you also have federated authorization, and therefore we have OAuth. OAuth mainly was realized because, um, because, for example, you have to give a Twitter app on your smartphone access to uh, your Twitter feed. And originally, without OAuth, you could only do this by providing your username and your password in this app. But again, your, your password is then spread all over the place. And if some of these clients is hacked, then your whole Twitter feed, your Twitter account is hacked. So in order to, to avoid this, you now have OAuth. And this is the, the, the screen that you sometimes see authorized. What is the example here? Tweet or web, a certain application or app to use your account. And here you, you have the, the flow that the user um, is, is asked to grant permission to a certain app. And then afterwards, this app, a client called here, just fetches uh, an authorization code from Twitter in order to then access uh, the Twitter feed of a certain user in name of his user. So this is a form of delegation and also a form of federated authorization and a very interesting technology if you're using uh, RESTful APIs, if you're using microservices, those kinds of things. It works very well with this. Um, JSON Web Tokens, I'm going to skip this. This is a, to this is a token format for, um, for the web, actually. Um, this is the, the structure, so it's, it's URL safe, and it's also signed for integrity checks. That's all, all I'm going to say about that here. And then finally, one very recent standard that I want to highlight is OpenID Connect. This is a successor of OpenID, but internally it works with completely different technology being all out. So here behind the screens, you still have the login with Google button. It's now actually used by, by Google, I think, already. <coughs> but behind the screens, this will be an OAuth call to an identity server at Google, where you um, get basic identity or user information from the authorization server and more details using an API call, an additional API call to Google. Again, the details are here. But know that if you want, uh, if you're considering OpenID, it's currently uh, considered deprecated, and OpenID Connect is considered the successor. Um, and there are a lot of uh, tools and libraries out there in order to abstract the, the, the protocol that I just explained from you. Hey, just, just a quick note on um, OAuth 2. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a, a replay attack on that, so we always uh, say that is it? one is still the best way to go. Yeah. 
this, that's what I briefly mentioned to you in the slide. Going back is hard. So OAuth 1 was a very narrow protocol and quite secure, I think, and OAuth 2 was then built by, by a consortium, how do you say that? And it's yeah. uh, interoperability and security suffers. Yeah. And is it, is it still not fixed? The, the, no? Okay. Yeah. Unfortunately, a lot is being built on top of OAuth 2, so I think OpenID Connect is also OAuth 2, not, not OAuth 1. Yeah, I know. There's just that one known attack that I know of. Yeah. Thanks for that comment. So that's all the content I wanted to bring across here. So a short recap and conclusion. The recap is what we talked about. Um, so access control prevents unauthorized access to protected information. And it's more than just authorization. It's triple A, authentication, authorization, and o o audit, audit, sorry. <laughs> Uh, and both of these work hand in hand, two sides of the same coin. And access control is often domain specific uh, with domain specific enforcement and domain specific access rules. Secondly, the properties that you should worry about if you're implementing access control yourself, expressiveness, efficiently, full mediation, maybe mainly that one, and then safety if you're looking at discretionary access control. And then different models that we discussed on mandatory and discretionary access control about who can access or assign permissions and then how permissions are assigned. That's identity-based, multi-level, role-based, and attribute-based access control. Then my main advice on how to enforce access control in application code is modularize for now. And in the future, you will be ready for policy-based access control, a very intriguing and very promising technology. And the bigger picture that you should think about is identity and access management. And then some final words. I hope that you're all convinced, same as me, that modern software all depends on access control. If you have any data of any value, then you need access control. But it's hard in practice because policies are complex to manage in a large organization. Policies are, uh, so access control implementation are imperfect because of bugs in the mechanism. And it's hard to translate your policies to certain mechanisms. And then, the final thing that I didn't discuss before, access control still depends on the absence of <coughs> other security bugs. So if you have a code injection attack, a SQL injection attack, access control will do you nothing. Um, so overall, my advice, even if you do the best practices that I discussed here, breaches will still occur. And like in any security branch, be prepared and avoid being caught off guard. Implement audit, implement additional security in-depth measures, etc. Uh, and so again, this is a very real problem in practice. So these are the references, the accreditation, and that's all I wanted to talk about. If there are any more questions, I'm available right now, uh, or I will be available during lunch. Thank you for your attention.